A perfect sequel. That's a prestigious title given to a very few dominant selection of games. Now, now for some reason, we're discussing that topic in a Pokemon Mystery Dungeon video. So at least, you know, from the beginning, we're ending on a good note. Pokemon Mystery Dungeon explores of time and darkness, but mainly Sky, because of course we're looking at the third and version as well. This group of games have quite a strong legacy to them, which is a problem for me as I love to pick the game apart and see it for what it is rather than the feelings attached. Meaning, yes, boys and girls, today it's time to criticize your favorite childhood game for its fumbles and give us sloppy for what it does right so we can see if or how good furry simulator 2 was actually and i do have to advise a spoiler warning because of background gameplay footage potentially cutting into story related nonsense yeah cool whatever let's start all right, first things first, the world itself, which is stupid easy to breeze through, courtesy of this game just doing the old reliable strat of just copying and pasting what worked and throwing on a new coat of paint. So first, a new world, woo, spooky. Of course, this time we get a new personality quiz, way more Pokemon, a more neatly organized town with more substance, character, and personality, zero amounts of fan service, and reskinning previous town features because this time it's different. Visually, they just de-rusted what worked previously. And all year of running around and babbling on the gameplay related nonsense to handle in said world is just pretty much the same. You know, saving, starting each day in a bed, running check missions, doing town junk, maybe talking to people, before setting off to do the all-important dungeon gameplay to rinse and repeat with story potentially in the way. Hitting that perfect sequel stride of just doing everything the first game did, but a bit better. But otherwise, this is useless, as this is hardly gameplay. Which, yeah, I guess it's dungeon time, huh? The dungeons themselves are a spitting image of the first game, which, for a small recap, still being those randomly generated play spaces, hazards and all, sometimes feeling fun to go through or complete another disaster. You truly never know until the game hits you with garbage and you just have to skill issue with it. As you wander around with all your AI control teammates obviously fighting Pokemon, a lack of resources, and the elements to inevitably find the stairs in the woods to win. This all came together to make some wacky, very RNG heavy game that would be very manageable with knowledge and good play, but very potentially punishing without. Being very hit or miss across the board, really winning with its Pokemon-y aspects to give it much of that charm. While it worked, some aspects needed notable improvements. So here, PMD2 tries and succeeds on that front, giving a much more polished but samey feel. So, what improvements you ask? Well, for a starter, recruitment was actually revolutionized. Where previously we saw team size cut you off from being able to get new partners, and then needing to pour monies into the ability to get them in the first place, alongside other picking and choosing of what could be gotten nonsense. Here, if a dungeon has recruitable mons, that's it. They're mostly lined up to join you without exception. That's a good start. But for Friend areas getting old Gellard means there's another set of artificial blocks and recruitment that's also dead in its tracks. This time keeping more money in your pockets while not poor shaming you, meaning everything can be gotten as soon as the game allows. And the best part is, once a mon joins you, that's it. You keep it. Not only can they die or just be sent home and not be lost forever, but if your team is packed, you're still able to recruit mons, although you do have to send somebody home immediately. Every inconvenience in recruiting outside of the luck factor is gone, and that's spectacular. Hell, even a handful of bosses are guaranteed recruits after the battle just to ensure you can't fail at getting them, wasting your time resetting. Again, only being a few, but gooder. All of these help make getting team members less painful, but team building doesn't have to stop there. As with friend areas dead, adding mons too and taking them off the team has never been faster. But the real reworks that come in with teams is the leader swapping and the team size nonsense. In terms of negatives, you lose the ability to change leaders mid-dungeon, lock to only being able to use it at the assembly shortly after starting the postgame, meaning yes, you do have to commit to a lead, which Objectively speaking is better game design, but the real redemption though is the fact that you can actually bring a full team of four into a dungeon instead of the game pretending you can, and then you just not being able to. Moving towards evolution, sadly like we'll see with the rest of the series, it's still post-game exclusive. The up here is that everything and everyone that can evolve is in a menu, making evolution just faster to do. The downside, however, is that you and your partner need to beat the entire post-game story to even evolve at all. Yeah, it's a simple case of give and take, and in this case, wow, they were taking pretty hard. In Battling Speak, we have one minor change, and that's a bit of a moveset thing, as now you can no longer teach Mons multiple copies of TM attacks anymore, so Bullet Seed Spam is truly dead. Looking at the items, obviously there's new stuff, yeah, act surprise. The new ups here come to a better item inventory system, as instead of having only up to 20 items by default, now over time, through game progression, you just unlock larger inventory in intervals of 8 up to a max of 48, bringing a drastically more freeing option 
opening angle on items. Obviously, this is much better, but considering all the game's other nonsense, sometimes this still doesn't feel like enough. One small contributor to that is the new held item rework. Instead of being taken out of the inventory, they're just equipped while in the bag. It's not manifesting more storage like the previous game did. If that doesn't clutter your inventory, surely the new blue items will. These guys are different, courtesy of granting boosts to specific mons without the need of being consumed or held. Yes, just passive buffs granted from existing. All of which truly adds up to make your inventory even more valuable than previously thought, and even more involved in the gameplay sense. In terms of other minor gameplay improvements, the extra ability-like things, which were IQ skills, have actually received a minor overhaul as well. As this time, Pokemon are given unique combinations of IQ skills built on the species of the Pokemon in question among 10 but really 8 lineups. Of course, granting variety and more uniqueness to mons across the board. While there are potential tier listing issues that can occur here, like Chikorita of all things being one of the best starters courtesy of IQ skills alone, it's still a massive win. Obviously, further encouraging the use of other mons to mess around with, the many talents granted here are none as the grind is still too long. But somehow, that's still not all. The IQ skills now don't have overlap, forcing you to pick and choose anymore, allowing you to finally plop it out onto the table. That and foes being able to use IQ skills themselves too, adds another layer of gameplay diversity. So you're not the only one that's overpowered. So one last note before we can dive straight into the playthrough, and that's new mission types. Whereas the objective list in the first game was pretty limited, this time we got a much better variety. While basic rescues, escorts, and item deliveries still exist, now we got a few new things. First, new restrictions on top of missions that don't really add much outside of making certain missions impossible to do, unique rewards such as mons being able to directly join you now, and of course new job types that involve fighting mini bosses and some new escort types. Yeah, that's about it, but it's just a lot more variety to spice up those randomly generating missions that you'll be grinding out over the course of a game. So yeah, it's a much needed bettering over various aspects of the game, taking what worked before and making it work more well. With the only downside here coming to how little gameplay stuff was actually altered, making it a bit better, yeah, but not really shaking up the experience enough to be a total game changer. Regardless from here, we get to shuffle over to actually playing through the game where this stuff gets put in action. Act surprised when tapping into the PMD2 experience, things are better, and there's quite a lot more to be had. Some for bad, but mostly for good. Throwing the Mons department at the wall, like the first games, we have a set of 16 starter Pokemon to essentially be lucked into specifically for Time and Darkness. Just with a little less variety, considering it's lacking some of the more unique PMD1 options. For a game-wide Mon count, we get a total of 491. Although that's not what you care about. You want to know about the recruits and encounters during the main game and post-game, don't you? Well, it's a mess not worth counting. Sorry to ruin your day, from Wonder Mail cheating availability and evolution existing to pump up post-game alongside all the optional dungeons, there's really no point. So we're only going to look at what the main game grants you to both fight with and against through the starters, foes, and dungeons, and bosses. Also featuring allies, but only really for time and darkness. So now, that number that the main game lets you duke it out with is a whopping 227 mons across the main game. Roughly speaking, of course. Obviously letting everything else open up with post-game and all that other junk. Yeah. Anticlimactic, I know, but that's why we didn't just do it before. So with that, buried and banished, how about the playthrough itself? Well, to put it lightly, this game's quite a bit longer than the first one. Where the first game only really had 14 necessary dungeons during its runtime, the game itself was deceptively short. Arguably too short when the game has you ending level-wise in the low 30s, usually unable to fully evolve. Here though, it's 23 dungeons over the span of 20 chapters, packed with story, not to mention an entire post-game narrative that is questionable in execution, but much better than the jumbled mess of the previous game's post-game voice. So first, let's speak on progression. You know, the whole dungeons and dungeon sh movement to beat the game. Essentially, once you start, you get two hyper-linear missions with Beach Cave and Drenched Bluff, where beating one leads to the other, being basic tutorial nonsense. But it turned out I lied, because it was three back-to-back -back dungeons, with Mount Bristol being tacked on alongside the town tutorials. Finally, bringing us to the tutorial that is the job system. If you think it's filler content, bad news! That's because it is! And that's before you hit your first dose of Century Dude which is not that problematic, it's just like, why are you here? Which again, sandwiched between even more filler. Yeah, that's one of the issues with this game having more runtime than the first one. It's more time to slowly drip feed content over the span of a game, but with even more time wasting nonsense. Regardless, it's waterfall cave time, and then even more story and filler gameplay. Then there's Apple Woods, backed up by a plethora of more side content. Some would say too much. Finally, dumping us into the 4-map gauntlet of Craggy Coast, Mount Horn, Foggy Forest, and Steam Cave, all on a back-to-back -back setting 
deciding where returning to town simply does not exist. It's one of those point of no return things, and guess what? It's time to clutch up, buddy. After this, you're blessed with just twiddling your thumbs, waiting for the plot with ant planes to happen, before throwing yourself at the Northern Desert Bulls quicksand cave duo, before more plot with the Crystal Cave and Crystal Crossing back to back. From here, you get even more just making you find your own fun until you're dragged off to another point of no return with the Chasm Cave, Dark Hills, Silt Ruins, and the Dust Force duo. From this point, it's just slowly paced story with the Tree Shroud Forest stuff and the random map repeats, alongside the final three map gauntlets with Brian Cave, Hidden Land, and Temporal Tower. While the front end of the main game has a little too much in the job spamming department, thankfully dropping off a bit with the back half, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Because for some reason, that's just too good for the game apparently, as the post game drops the ball hard. As we get one immediate dungeon with the Mystifying Forest run, before each and every time after this, needing to do more jobs to eventually lock access to the Blizzard Island plus Crevice Cave duo, eventually the surrounding C plus Miracle C duo, it's eventually the Aegis Cave nonsense, and then once again, eventually hitting the endgame gauntlet with Mount Travail, the Nightmare, Spatial Rift, and Dark Crater. Before that little bit more for the Mana Fee recruits. While the post game does have ideas, unfortunately the execution of just spam missions until you're dragged in a plot is not very fun. Not in the main game, and especially not in the post game. Just kind of fumbling what would have otherwise been a fun funnel of content with filler, not the most thrilling bit of gameplay. The real issue with all the mission related grinding though, is how it gets in the way of the level curve. While the level curve isn't this big boogeyman like we see in the mainline games around this time and way sooner, our big problem is how much the story required jobs can over or under supply your EXP yields, as in most instances story progression requires you to do X amount of jobs to progress the story, meaning the act of piling all those missions into a single dungeon run versus running through several different dungeons, it can actually backfire, because you're fighting way less Pokemon because you want to save time. It's as black and white as fighting more mons through more game time, and that can make for a more volatile experience, especially when post game is brought into the picture and loads of more optional content is on the table. Typically, the main game is going to end somewhere around the low to mid 40s, and the post game nonsense should spit you out around the low 50s, assuming you're playing in a way that we picture a normal player doing it. But ultimately, this is just a wild guess. Maybe you're just abusing golden seeds or something, who knows. In terms of difficulty, this set of games I'd argue is quite a bit harder, for better and for worse. Quicksand K, for instance, is a great mid-game challenge, testing your item-carrying abilities to handle the constant sandstorms and monster houses, while also generally carrying around some power creep. This is a good example. The bad examples of annoying difficulty would absolutely be the Dialga and Palkia fights. Okay, so imagine a room-wide attack that'll kill on crit during their story battles, otherwise two-shotting. And it's a mystery if they'll even do the attack in the first place. Yes, it's essentially gambling, in which, because of RNG fishing, I'd argue the Darkrai fight could be even worse. Obviously ignoring the lightning rod to spite specifically the Pikachu players. However, without a doubt, the biggest dud in the entire game, and it's not even a hard thing, it's just bad design, goes down to Aegis Cave. Honestly, it deserves an entire hate video on its own, but for a TLDR, it's a massive luck check with copious amounts of standing around and getting shafted before you can even progress, all while there are no save points in sight. To call it a pace breaker is the craziest understatement one could make. It makes me miss the filler content, please bring it back. Although, feeding into that, well, it's kind of harder thing, would be the story actually supplying us with some forced escort missions, essentially covering six and a half stages for the main game with a little bit extra in post. Very helpful as defending just you and your partner gets a little bit too easy with time, adding a bit more to the offering through protecting AI that's sometimes a bit too dumb to do anything worthwhile. Meanwhile, yet another means of adding difficulty they pounced on would actually just be flat out locking your teams far more often. There are still plenty of situations, some would argue too many, where the game just locks you to your main two people. While it can be decent for stage variety, these sections unfortunately nuke the level curve specifically for your recruitables, whereas PMD1 still technically did have the issue, here there's just significantly more of these droughts, meaning those mons that you recruit just kind of end up sucking and fall off pretty hard due to how frequently the game just wants you to stop leveling them. Absolutely spitting in the face of recruitment for main story and even some post game as well. Obviously delaying when you'll finally dive into partners. Anyways, for our playthrough, we got one final section with two little things to note. First being something actually new with the game, which is actually a minor downside. That is just locking you out of certain dungeons once you've beaten them. During the main story, plenty of dungeons just cannot be ran back for narrative reasons. So for that reason, you can't go back till post game, which that is fine. However, certain other dungeons in the story, being Chasm Cave, Dark Hills, Silver, 
Wild Ruins, Dusk Forest, Deep Dusk Forest, and The Nightmare, these all hold value in never being repeatable. So each playthrough makes them feel more valuable, but never coming back after post-game and post-post-game just makes them feel forgettable, even if the game still has a healthy amount of content otherwise. Of course, our second little breath of fresh air corrects a mistake from the first game, and that is the need for HMs to access certain dungeons. If you can go there, there's nothing limiting you now outside of plot or unlocks. No mon move slots need to be sacrificed and no item slots either. This pointless limitation is dead and we gotta ponder how Chunsoft got away with this during Gen 4, yet it took Game Freak three generations of mainline games after to reach the same conclusion of, damn, maybe team building shackles like this aren't worth having. Well gamers, that's basically playing through the game. It's really, once again, I gotta say it as a broken record, doing the same thing again but better and more. Doubling, arguably tripling down on the good ends of the experience while unfortunately keeping some of the bad intact. Well, it's a good thing people don't really play these games with the gameplay, right? <laughs> Oh, thrilling. Side content and features between the three games. The first, let's just start by pushing through the copy and paste from the previous games through all the town stuff, because they're just normal important features. So again, with our town features, where else to start but the bank? It's completely untouched in the last game. You put money in, you take money out, safe from the towns of defeat. This time, without a super big annoying feature to blow said money on. Meaning you actually get to use more of it now. The standard shops return once again, one featuring normal items, and the other ones with the orbs and TMs. With a version existing in Dungeon as well, just in case getting greedy and being instantly punished looked appealing. The item storage is once again back, this time different, as it was made worse. Previously, we had massive stacks for multiple of the same item, essentially giving us next to no limit. Here in PMD2, however, there's a very limited store space with items that are not stackable, unless it's throwable. Meaning, no, you cannot just deposit everything you get and simply ignore it, because you can and will run out of room for your actual important stuff, which is arguably even more valuable granted a higher supply of stronger items in the game. Getting more storage though actually requires you to, surprise, play the game via the rescue team ranks. Still gotten from the game's drop system, just this time with a much larger in-game grind. Also, the Kangaskhan rocks work exactly the same as last time. Move linking is back again for your broken mon killing needs, still needing 500 monies to link attacks, and the ability to remember old attacks remains free as the feature is just free skinned and nothing more. For something new, Zatu allows you to find box openings, essentially getting these weird drops in dungeons, only capable of being opened here. And to put it as simple as possible, it's gambling. Getting complete nothing items or those very powerful items with their passive effects courtesy of just being bagged. The rewards are definitely worth the addiction. These end up though tying into the Krogan Swap Shop, essentially allowing you to trade out families of these blue items for their more powerful effects and not much else. Yes, on a 1 plus 1 type beat. Next we have a mostly pointless addition but still has a minor purpose, which would be Chansey's Daycare. Essentially you can get eggs sometimes as mission rewards. They will end up coming here automatically, and after a few days pass, it'll hatch. Then you'll get a new level 1 team member with the catch of potential egg moves. Meaning not only are you sitting here gambling for the cracked mons when you can't force them to appear, much less even guarantee these attacks in the first place, because you do want that optimal gameplay, but this just puts another RNG form on to make the hatched mons have a higher ceiling of potential, actively giving you a reason to avoid naturally recruiting mons mid-map, just being a bit of a fumble because there's only a few mons that don't really get egg moves. Everything else you technically do want to hatch. Our last obvious feature thing is of course the Marowak Dojo, being yet another reskin, hosting small bite-sized type-based dungeons to just experience. Wow, crazy, it's cute and serves next to no purpose. This time, without a mini boss at the end. Still meandering about the town, we have the mission boards. Yes, two as we get up to eight randomly generating missions across two different types of boards, meaning up to a max of 16 divided by normal goals and the boss-oriented ones, mainly just giving you more options for content to slip and slide into. For other story progression mandatory junk that slightly comes off as filler content is Century Duty, a game where the mon's footprint is shown and you gotta use your vast knowledge of Pokemon feet you've previously used for personal reasons to solve the question against a clock, obviously being rewarded more points for speedrunning your answers correctly. In terms of overworld, that's actually all for Time and Darkness, so now, menus. Wonder Mail returns once again in order to get 
get missions from other people, or to be abused with an online generator to access more job requests that are obscenely exploitable. Two big things exist to note here, though. Time and Darkness actually do have a different Wonder Mill system compared to Sky, meaning their missions can actually never be shared between the two types of games. But secondly, it's actually required to access a set supply of dungeons, only able to be played after the Scizor post-game plotline is dealt with, giving this section minor gameplay implications and access to more mods that you otherwise cannot get. Which finally leaves us with Friend Rescue. It's unchanged. Going to a dungeon to rescue a fallen friend so they can continue where they left off. Damn, who cares? Also, trading items returns once again to never be used. So yeah, that's pretty much everything for the gameplay end of Time of Darkness, meaning we can finally talk about the new specific stuff for the version you'll actually play. Alright, with our third improved version here, we get what's undoubtedly the definitive edition of PMD2. And it's not really arguable at all, as just about everything is a nice addition or an improvement to something that has already existed. So first up is the new Pokemon. It's quite literally just Shaman in its Sky form. And if that was all, it would probably be a small bummer. So how about we throw in Giratina's origin form as well and call it a day. And yes, I don't even know what a Rotoma plant is. No, seriously, they're the game's missing platinum content. Why are they not here? Obviously, between Giratina and Shaman, two forms. There are stat differences, obviously, alongside Shaman's perpetual state of being sped up. But how it works is the more important question. Skyman has gotten through a consumable item, meanwhile Giratina with an actual ability only shows up when playing on new dungeons introduced in Sky because yes, new dungeons do exist. Ultimately, the forms don't add too much, but they're mechanically new, so they need to be mentioned. Yeah, we're at 492 mons in the game now, how swell. Alongside that note of extra dungeons, there's even more items in both normal items and the passive blue ones. And one last quick note to throw in before we move on to the Mon's nonsense is the addition of an extra save point, and the ability to go straight to the main menu when saving as well. Actually, this is a big game changer. Now, patching up some of our critter stuff, we have new starters. This time, packing up to 20 options for your main duo of nonsense. Even if that means Munchlax and Meowth become partner exclusive for some reason. Glancing towards the other relevant encounter changes, we got the best one first, being the death of version exclusives. Yes, so all the mods in the game can be gotten without external means, not only for the first time in Mystery Dungeon, but kickstarting the trend of all games to follow being standalone copies, incapable of having such a pointless game worsening feature again. But the real note here is the minor encounter pool changes, because yes, there are small changes like the subtle changing of the Ant Plane's first visit boss fight, like the obtaining method for a few legendaries coming to a new job type for instance, just granting the game the small amount of extra flair to make playing it after time in darkness seem less pointless. Although, no way! He made a relevant transition, guys! As with jobs, we have even more job types on the board, all of which center a bit on being boss battles. Challenge invites exist to be a more standard version of just a normal boss battle. The ambush outlaws will show up and drop monster houses on you. Yes, even in dungeons that don't normally get them. And the fleeing outlaws also exist in an effort to try to skedaddle off the stairs and avoid death, but obviously fail. Being three, but really two mix-ups to the outlaw formula that doesn't just end in the simplest of 1v1s, at least giving some needed flair to the outlaw lineup and moving a few legendaries didn't hurt either. Getting missions is also a bit easier now too, as two extra methods for getting them exist, one with random bottles on the beach, which sometimes just flat out never spawn, and another with a new town feature that we've yet to see. Regardless though, you're very likely still going to the message boards, which means now it's time for the updated town features. First up, we'll start with a new one, Spindus Cafe. Here we get two real features, a drink making nonsense session with Spinda to milk plenty of extra stats out of gummies, and the recycles shop to give up a wide variety of items to get new, more valuable ones. And even better, it features gambling on top, all while still earning access to new dungeons. It's simply goaded, you know, ignoring the four story moments. The Krogan Swap Shop has actually been updated to the mess that you may have not have noticed earlier. Instead of now just having the one plus one, potentially one plus one plus one item trading sessions, now you get access to way more trading options that are not dependent on exclusively being part of item families, but rather you exchange a certain amount of blue items to just get new ones. Sadly, the pool though is picked from random. Regardless, this is a massive one-up from what Time in Darkness had. A little bit out of the way though, we get access to the Sky Gifts feature. Essentially here, loot boxes. It's gambling and not much else to say. And you only get these from one dungeon anyway, so like, who cares? Wrapping up our not gameplay related junk, the main menu this time gives us access to the jukebox. Yes, allowing you to re-listen to all the game's music. But how good is said music? Well, no spoilers yet, of course. 
but good lord, this was absolutely needed. Closing back in on the gameplay additions. First up is a new feature thing being the Secret Bazaar, essentially a reward for stumbling across a random concealed staircase. Here you get guys each with their own services at a small cost. Mime Jr. shop purging hunger and PP related nonsense. Shetty essentially giving you the ability to use an escape orb. Licky Licky being even more nasty to your sticky items, somehow cleaning them in slobber. And of course, Swalot with guess what boys, more gambling. Just pulling up here is reward enough since even if you buy nothing, you're still essentially cheating the natural staircase of the previous floor. And moving on a bit faster as of course, you just move on as normal. Just a fun luck rewarding feature that you'll probably forget about or spend a lot of time trying to track down as they just don't ever spawn. <laughs> in terms of new story content, there's a lot, but first new post game stuff. As you get access to a new dungeon that's forced in the post game story despite having no narrative value. And here it's just an escort sequence across plenty of quick paced sections with a little feature that lets you skip past some areas on repeat runs. Yeah, that's just about it. Mainly just forced through association with Shaman itself. Although that's the lesser details. From the main menu, you can access brand new story content through the special episodes. These are side stories past, present, and future with the side characters of the game that you've cared about deeply for character building purposes. Although for us right now, the gameplay side of things. Episodes eventually get unlocked through playing the main game. Here, you're given control of a character at a default level, potential team members, and an inventory that you can transfer in and out of your main save. The struggle through a set pool of dungeons and the bosses to tag along and crush your dreams. Otherwise, it's simply a selection of mildly challenging dungeons due to your default levels and kits being kind of mediocre but obviously fixable. Again, just really being a plot thing unless you test out other characters just because. The only real fumble with the special episodes though is just sitting through the credits every single time you beat one. Why did they greenlight this? And outside of additional plot and new music, that's just about it for Explorers of Sky. Plenty of new maps, the bettering of pre-existing features and other minor gameplay offerings, while really just adding nothing negative in contrast. Truly making Sky the definitive experience between the three versions, as it is content complete on top of the new stuff. The best part is, there is still more. But as for now, we get to what I would argue is the game's greatest height. When we start peaking the visual side and audio end again, it's very much like the original PMD games, but notably better. Visually, the game is an absolute treat to the eyes, this time making the environments more detailed to an obvious success, generally being an absolute classic that'll hold up for ages to come, being an absolute icon at the top of the DS lineup, although a part of me does want to see Turquoise Grovile return. I'm not too big on this green one, man, I'll say it now. But in terms of the soundtrack, it blows the graphics apart. Here, we have one of the single greatest soundtracks to ever touched a Nintendo system ever, and I wish I was over-exaggerating. You either have the extreme heights of the absolute bangers, or you have the, wow, this is pretty good, of like, the normal fine tracks. There's nothing that really sticks out as bad ever. Just a massive win across the board, and yes, I'm kind of underselling it. On both bottoms of the not-gameplay pyramid, it's a resounding success. Well, fortunately for us, we get to go there now, because there's plot. There's a lot of plot. Alright gamers and gamettes, this story is surprisingly one of those that require a bit of a spoiler warning, like suggested by the intro, as it's a narrative that's pretty well enjoyed, handled to a thrilling extent, and to take that experience away from you entirely of seeing it through for the first time is not a fun thought to do, and obviously a summary is not going to do the game justice. So with that said, to avoid total spoilers, just give ahead entirely past the section and the two to follow to see how things wrap up. Otherwise, get your popcorn or something, although I'd wish you would have started eating it 20 minutes ago. So just just like the last time, the game opens with a personality test to expose your shallowest, lightest secrets before throwing some text boxes at you with very important implications. Your partner is just busy having a personality before, of course, meeting you. And guess what, buddy? You have amnesia and are stuck with two memories of formerly being a human and your name. Gee, I wonder why this feels copy and pasted from somewhere. Regardless, talking ensues and your partner gets mugged and you're off to the first dungeon in order to hopefully get their item back or after defeat to see some really silly dialogue. In terms in terms of the game's humor, it's pretty nice when it needs to be, not ruining otherwise deep moments in the game. Standouts obviously include the failed attempts at the beach and trench bluff failures. But most importantly, when Chimeko holds Explorers of Sky Players hostage with some meta text to laughing at Pokemon game design. With Coughing and Zubat defeated, your partner's insignificant pebbles is saved. After some nonsense, you and your buddy become a team under the Weekly Tough Guild and to be tasked with missions and intending to humble the player or something. Just to learn that the mons in this continent are absolutely loaded and that working for the man is 
is a scam. The next piece of story involves you being tutored around before learning that you're apparently just here to force the plot to happen with a very wacky ability to simply imagine stuff. As this Azuril is in immediate danger of, uh, this very pleasant looking fellow. And after like two minutes, you realize that everything you just imagined is real as Drowsy is of course a criminal. But congrats, you're able to interrupt his nefarious plans and deal with some trash talk before of course laying him to waste. Stopping your first criminal and helping out two siblings in dire need of help. You're introduced to the Time Gears as a concept and their value to the world, while one is of course nabbed for plot reasons. Time passes, a pointless dungeon happens to let you know your daydreaming ability thing actually lets you take a peek through time itself. Yes, both past and future, and then you get introduced to the real Team Skull. Being those two fools from earlier and their actually competent boss just looking to harass your partner. And while they do plot to ruin a later adventure for you, they messed around and now it's time for you to find out on a food fetching quest. All in an effort to get cutscene, shoot up a chance on it, and die in real life. Congrats, it's time for more filler and an expedition, mainly to pull out growth for your partner, more hearing voices in your head to solve a puzzle, and of course the time years internet earlier to actually exist, posing more questions than answers. So with that, you're back to the old grind, you end up meeting Dusknor who's absolutely a good guy and totally not pretending to be. Another time gears jacked and Team Skull does a little bit of trolling, essentially sending you to your doom over an item the blue fellows wanted to get back. You go, you fight, you almost get cutscene. The game goes and important plot stuff goes down, essentially coming clean to Mr. Good Guy about your ability to see or hear across time, your existence as a human, and of course your name, which he clearly reacts to for foreshadowing reasons, meaning oh god, oh crap, run please. But a call is put out, as of course, Time Gear 3 goes bye-bye, and a face to the culprit is had. Yeah, it's Grovile. People love this guy to oblivion for some reason, and this game is why. Let's hope he's actually the bad guy, and actually not the good guy with perspective being pulled against you. They would never pull a second twist like that, right? With this tragedy upon the world, through the things holding time together getting pocketed, the guild has to go off and stop Grovile, or at least try to find the Time Gears in advance, to stop them from being taken. People are given places to go, noting that Crystal Cave is marked in dungeon name text color, just like your destination, almost like they're both special or something. And then there's nothing here. What a waste of time. But by sheer luck, you have a hunch and come back the next day because of course you know this place. And here you're able to find the path forward. Important because time gear, this time being stolen before your eyes. Of course, with you getting cutscened, before of course getting to see the power and horror of the time gears when they're removed, freezing time. With you barely escaping somehow. Now, while your team in the Pokemon world in general are on the back foot, things look grim. But because of your plot device with the power of foresight, the Crystal Cave is your next destination, and a last ditch plan is in order. And wow, you barely make it in time. And despite whether or not you win or lose the fight with Grobile, you of course say it with me, ladies and gentlemen, and get cutscened. But thankfully, good guy Dustmore shows up and is able to stop him from taking Azelf's life to grab that bag. And he's gone. From here, it's mass dialogue time with huge world building. Essentially, Dustmore sets up a plan to ambush Grobile and capture him, but that really doesn't matter. It's the big drops of Grobile's plan, claiming he's essentially going to stop time itself to give the world a bleak never ending nothing from snagging the funny treasures. Yes, gentlemen, time is gonna stop. The fact Dustmore knows all of this despite it never being possible to have happened yet is the best part. It's obviously because he's from the future as well. Yeah, it's a time travel story now, gentlemen. And Grovile is as well. Of course, making Dustmore's mission to eliminate him to save the world from falling into ruin. Or so it's said. As he's from the future, we have to trust him and he can't possibly be manipulating the narrative in the slightest. Regardless, time passes, man is captured, meaning it's time for Dustmore to leave. Back! to the future to of course take the troublemaker with him man if only grova wasn't muzzled to fix the narrative hmm oh well sad goodbyes are given all's about to be happy and um uh somebody do something please oops surely that was an accident right surely this isn't because dustnor is evil right and off to the future you go waking up in prison and betrayed you're immediately hauled off to be executed well that's fascinating with some fast thinking you your partner and grova escape he ditches you because working together is hard but it's okay it's only three measly dungeons Surely your partner is thinking completely rationally. No, they're just having character development, right? They need it. Before saving Grovile from Doomed, where it can finally happen. Yes, the record gets set straight. Grovile with his narrative of being the complete 180 of what Dustin or the obvious evil guy had said prior. Of course, your partner is unable to believe what can be explained away through action, but logic has to do the talking. So, hey, look, you team up in a fragile state to take a trip back in time. And to do that, you gotta find Celebi in no way, one dungeon later, and you find her. Now getting a fourth partner, her goal 
well as to send the three of you back in time, while for some reason mistaking you for Grovile's partner. Foreshadowing, sure, but hey, did you know he had a partner? No? Cool. So after the dungeon, Dusknoir is here to shatter your dreams again. Or Grovile's, rather, as his confidence of fighting Dusknoir is one thing, but that shattering immediately when Dialga is showing up alongside him is more than enough to make him give up. But it's fine, as Grovile's, of course, confident with his partner still being in the past to save the day, should your squad die here. But of course, the truth has to get dragged out, gentlemen, that you, the player, the former human, the unpasant, is his partner. Yeah, oversharing really does backfire sometimes, huh? Regardless, despite the rampant god of time being on the other side, somehow through the power of not giving up, the trio is able to escape. So back in the now, it's time to get plotting for some time gear-fetching shenanigans to save the world. And after some foreshadowing, good lord game, chill out please, this has happened too many times already, you go where time stopping started. After gaming, a terrifying revelation is hit, as despite the time gear going back to where it's supposed to rest, time is still frozen, which shouldn't be happening. So from here, the path forward is pretty cut and dry because time is stopping for a different reason, being Temporal Tower itself is falling apart. Meaning cool, new objective. So with that, Grovel starts fetching Bronze Lord shaped disc and you gotta go find the hidden land. Meaning time to do stuff, like finally return to the guild and set things straight. Because they still don't know what's going on before a mostly pointless dungeon of backtracking and more plot. Here, we get two goals. The first is going to Brian Cave to reach the hidden land. The second goal is to not laugh at the sus game being mentioned. While thing happens, team's goal is finally back into the story to a reenact their plot of chapter one, stealing the relic fragment because of course it's important now for crossing the sea. And hey look, you got the thing back, good job. Chat talk gets completely walloped, three hooligans are beaten, and now people talk, yada yada, it's time for endgame. Through riding Lapras, you reach the hidden land, beating dungeons, yada yada, Dustinor finally returns, obviously planning to take you back to the reference, so time can remain, but of course a fight ensues, because of course it does, and he gets beaten down and takes a big old ball to the face. For some reason, you don't throw him straight through the time hole, but talk instead. You know, plot. Basically, while your partner is getting the ride ready off screen, important info is dropped on the player for the first time. Just the small, insignificant knowledge that you changing the world is going to make all the Pokemon of the future feel not so good and fade out of reality because of altered timeline shenanigans. A fate that the two of you had once accepted, although that's before amnesia. But this, Dustmore realizes he's still not down yet, just for Grovile to try to defend you, or of course, the green guy throws out his last option to simply take him back to the... No, I'm not gonna make the reference. You get the joke. This plan ensures Dustinor can never interrupt again, even if Grovel can't assist more with the end. Leaving the time gears in a hurting departure. With an expiration date on your life your partner is completely unaware of, it's time for the final mission. And one nest of discharge spammers later, and you're finally at the top. Dialga is going unga bunga primal mode because final boss. So clearly talking to him's not gonna work. Dusting the final battle on you. And after winning, it's a complete utter disaster as of course, the tower's falling apart. Again, you put the things in place and then everything simply ends to begin once again because of course the world was saved time is moving again good job all's well that ends well but actually that's a lie because now of course it's time for you to go you've prevented your own existence so the paradox just magically resolves itself by taking you with a sad farewell to another friend your partner carries on slowly but surely spreading the word and all that good stuff months pass very important detail your partner heads out to be greeted with a very nostalgic scene to serve to bring back a flood of memories all at once of the main game's adventure too much for the poor fellow that it breaks him. And the credits roll, baby. Let's go. But of course, it can't just end there. As of course, Dialga, who's been sitting around doing nothing of value, finally decides that the hero of the world needs a gift to quell their sorrow. <laughs> Meaning, oh, hey, look, you're back. And this definitely won't cause any issues with the fabric of space or anything of the sort, right? And that's how the main story ends. A tale of time travel, saving the world, sacrifice, unbreakable friendships, of course, a very strong will, and a metric load of strong character moments that I couldn't remotely even get close to speaking about. Anyways, gamers, we're done with the first of the story sections. Help, I'm begging, please. Thankfully for us, the post game is not a single massive slab of content in the manner the main story is, but rather smaller standalone stories, so this should not take that long at all. After starting back at the credits and all that, your story continues with your graduation test from the guild. Essentially, it's time for you to leave the nest. So now all you gotta do is find a dollar in the whites. The issue is you get dragged into fighting the grandmaster of all things bad and his henchmen. Surprise, you did the thing and now you get the funny and learn about evolution, which of course you can't do because fabric of space nonsense. Yeah, gee, I wonder why. 
Regardless, you succeed in your task, so now it's time for you to move out and live in the only other possible place that's available. So now a little time passes, and you get a completely worthless rescue narrative-wise. More time passes, and your team gets news of a new dungeon to explore. You go and eventually get an egg, surprise it hatches into a manaphy, and that's a problem, because raising a baby is not in your skill book. So after pulling some blue gummies out of storage, or running through pointless dungeons, bad news arrives, gentlemen, manaphy gets sick, and you gotta go off to the Miracle Sea to bring it back to good health. But because raising it outside of its domain is a problem, it's gotta go be raised in the sea by someone competent at doing so. So of course, it's time to say goodbye. Even more time passes, and we get this completely purposeless story bit, where these incredibly well-known explorers come by the guild to bring everyone in to explore some ruins. Yeah, not only are they complete nothings for Time and Darkness players, but the map itself in story is completely pointless. So we get to skip that part of narrative, leading us to some bad stuff. Outside of you having a not-so-good sleep, that Alul Azuro you've helped out twice now ends up falling into a never-ending nightmare. So in order for you to help him, you gotta go into the dream, and only one man for the job can help you there, and that's Drowsy, baby. Yeah, he may be a reformed criminal who's previously threatened some heinous things, but hey, we'll trust he's telling the truth because it's never backfired before. Luckily, he's able to send you to the dream, you beat the dungeon, reach the end, and unfortunately, nothing can be done. But Cresselia shows up and wants to use you as a blood offering for world peace because of that whole fabric of space and balance or whatever. Thankfully, though, Drowsy's able to interrupt it, sparing your life, pulling you out, and everything is still unfortunate, which doesn't begin to describe... However, a little birdie on the grapevine lets you learn of a Pokemon that controls space itself to try and solve this issue. Although while you're minding your own business, dreaming about playing Minecraft or something, Palkia just shows up uninvited, not even using the front door, and whisks you off the spatial rift in order to make you unalive. He tries putting you down, but you put yourself down literally by complete sheer luck. So it's dungeon time. Until the literal dead end is reached for a boss fight. After winning, things just get whack as Palkia gets put into a nightmare that you can apparently enter. And you do. But it turns out Cresselia shows up up to kill you again. Although this bleak acceptance is not really the greatest position to be in, there's a lot of manipulation going on. I mean, you got the angry space god seeing that you're not wicked and nefarious, despite the narrative being so. Well, gentlemen, fortunately, it's just a mind game. And the real Cresselia shows up to set the record straight, and Darkrai has to leave with only an invitation left. And his goals of drowning the world in a different form of darkness is known, and immediately asked to prep for the final battle. And after trekking through the dungeon with 80 gazillion reviver seeds, the confrontation begins. Darkrai essentially drops big information on you, mainly stating that he was the one behind the collapse of Temporal Tower, because of course it wouldn't happen naturally. Which is less important because it's already mentioned. He also claims to have been the one that messed up your initial travel to the present during Chapter 1, simply known as the reason you got amnesia. So yeah, he's also here despite your future changing shenanigans. But that's just the thing. He's essentially the mastermind of the game's main conflict, which really makes you wonder at how no plot threads really led here. Regardless, it's time to put him to rest, and it's all over, but it's actually not, because the big man tries to run off. And because of his pointless monologue, logging nonsense, the angry space god that he manipulated has time to show up and completely blow him to smithereens. Mid-time travel, so, um, hey, guess what? We know for a definitive fact he can never be a threat again, as he gets an unconfirmable recreation of your amnesia. Yes, this is peak fiction that is just somehow willed into existence, putting an end to this plot thread. Bringing us to the final plot point, which is Manaphy returning due to its health no longer being an issue. Yay. <laughs> Thankfully for us, that's all with time and darkness in mind. Some more story that's mostly filler. Yes, it's ignoring the actual thriller gameplay, but when the good comes in, it becomes a thrilling way to finish off the game, bringing the whole thing for a truly good time. Although I will say it's a shame, as despite all the glazing the story gets, a minor inconvenience is about like 60% of the characters just aren't that good. Like you have your good ones, don't get me wrong, your dust nors, your grow piles, your partners, and my personal bias towards Team Tasty, the hidden gems they are, but like man, there's a lot just fumbling with next to no impact or character. Like what does Corefish even do? The quality surely does walk a fine line. So yeah, that's where things were supposed to end, but because Explorers of Sky exists, sadly, we gotta move on to, get this, a third story section. With Explorers of Sky in particular, the story is not just a copy and paste. Well, completely that is, because new pieces of plot exist. Because this game is called Sky, they had to shove Shaman into the plot somehow. And for this, one pointless plot addition, specifically in the post-game, sandwiched between Guild Graduation and the Scizor Rescue. It has you explore up Sky Peak with a tour guide. Yeah, that's about it, it's completely pointless. And that's just me ignoring the Spindus Cafe nonsense getting injected to the main story during earlier points of the game. Like, that's all the main experience gets. Oh, I 
I know is that it's essentially filler plot-wise, providing quite literally physically nothing to the story of any real value. Thankfully, though, that's not all there is. As again, Sky brought us this special episode. Five of them, all of which are impactful, some significantly more than others. So beginning in the order you unlock them, first is Bidoof's wish. Essentially, Bidoof minds his own business before having a map thrusted upon him, where he then teams up with the Bozo who gave him the damn thing. But oh no, he's working with some goons in an effort to mug him. And after disaster, the guild shows up to back up Bidoof in a heartfelt-ish moment before he stumbles further into the cave to battle Jirachi. From here, he earns a wish. One that involves getting new guild members, which would end up being you and your partner. So not only did Bidoof accidentally almost bring Apocalypse onto the world, but he also indirectly saved it as well. Good stuff. In Igglybuff the Prodigy, we are given a story from Wigglytuff's childhood. What happens is the inevitable guildmaster, but literally a child, gets tricked into going into some spooky tree line and ends up befriending the Armaldo found here, who ends up seeing massive potential in Igglybuff as an explorer and takes him off on a dungeon treasure hunting where they obviously succeed, which is enough for a student teacher thing to form over here. Time passes and another adventure is had, but uh oh, disaster strikes. It's who else but the feds show up. Yeah, it turns out Armaldo was or is a criminal. So it's time to take him away in a scene that's tough on the young guildmaster, but with him gone, that first treasure remains a memento of his teacher in the presence. Quite literally the only reason this story starts in the first place. Uh, I was supposed to mention something here about Skuntank wanting to mug him for this. Anyways, today's Oh My Gosh is the most pointless special episode yet. Here's on Flora is tasked with stopping an outlaw, where she does nothing of value besides eventually winning and solving her beef with Loudred. Wow, cool. Next? Oh wait, next is Here Comes Team Charm. Because as if if we needed more of them. Regardless, these hooligans go treasure hunting. At some point, they meet Wigglytuff for the first time. Meanwhile, no Igus Cave key plot comes up at all. Then there's little competition for Weavile's team. Before reaching the bottom, hooting and hollering and nonsense before realizing the true treasure was in fact a time year, which obviously nobody can take. Although that does throw up more questions about multiple time years existing and why we had to grab the big ones in the main story, but whatever. Also, this chest has a dialogue box and it's awesome, which leaves us with In the Future of Darkness, easily the best of the special episodes. Picking up a Grovile's story once he finally departs, he arrives in the future unchanged from Purgatory, accepting that you've obviously not fixed history yet. He sets off to stop Primal Dialga from initiating a plan B, or rather at least buying time for history to be goodered alongside bickering with Dustnor about motivations in the such. With that, he's off before Dustnor has time to match back up. At this time, the two of them are attacked by Dustnor's former henchmen, and from here they teamed up for the sketchiest of truces gaming has ever had. And after gameplay, we get an interrogation scene. Essentially, the Sableye spills the tea about why they betrayed the big guy. The big reason is the fact that he's been replaced by some resourceful individual we've obviously never seen. And yes, the Dialga also wants to dispose of him, which gives Dustinor more resolve to see this little incident through. Regardless, here, they make it to Temporal Tower. And it's at this point where you gotta be wondering, what the hell? Why is time not fixing itself yet? The main two only had one ride alongside a singular tower climb. Why are we even doing this dungeon? repeat, plus why is time still frozen? Regardless, bad news. Big guy ain't here, meaning it's time to go find Celebi and stop that agent from sneaking away through time the easy way. And oh, how exciting, another dungeon repeat. Another dungeon later, and you finally realize, wow, the future doesn't completely take place in the hidden land. Yeah, crazy idea. Blizzard Island had to be thrown in here as well. Regardless, Dustmore ends up learning more about Grovile or something before disaster almost strikes, but Grovile gets saved by his bestie. And another ambush happens. Yada yada character development time again. Essentially more of what's this guy's deal type stuff and Dustin are putting on a hate face and henchman plot stuff before picking the green guy's brain about his motivations and the such. Truly the stuff we care about. Mainly that need to understand Grovile's resolve in altering history despite the fact that it will cost him his life and whatnot trying to make sense in something that he could not fight for because obviously living matters. But with Grovile it's not so black and white as it's not a matter of living long. Rather what you accomplish with that life. The impact you have on the world. That type of thing. While it's yet to be evident this does end up rubbing off on Dustnor, but of course right now we're immediately being shoved into another dungeon before the other massive plot drop happens. The two finally find Celebi and uh-oh, it's a trap. Yeah, it turns out Dustnor actually had the time to be evil and mislead Grovile the entire time. You know, the Sableye beef, that was fake. The existence of the henchman, fake. What, did you actually think Darkrai was going to be the henchman? Why would he work for Dialga? He essentially ruined that guy's life. Although it turns out that henchman plot's not completely untrue, or the big guy wants to sap Grovile Grovile's spirit out of his body, so that Dustnor can pilot it back to the past and eliminate the two that went off to fix time. Yeah, that's uh, disturbingly specific, but very effective for the part where the 
green sus guy's trust was not only his biggest weakness, but of course his biggest strength. As of course he did manage to find an understanding with Dustmar. Somehow. And it works as the man breaks. It's enough for him to step in grow while nearly dying. But sadly, betrayal's not the prettiest thing. With a grand plan foiled, everything is just bad. But before that, a break in time. Yes, time finally starts flowing again, which is enough to get the Olga going and the heroes back on their feet for one final push. After all, they're on a timer now. Things go exactly as you'd expect at this point. The three winners win, and much like we've seen before, it's time to pass. Dustin Orr finally made something with his life. That bromance finally pulled through. And Celebi finally gets to see the damn sign. Grovile laid down his life for what he believed in. Just like that, we fade out. For them all to come back moments later because of course they wouldn't just die. The Pokemon company's too afraid to kill people off. Come on now. Yes, some excuse of a higher being keeping them here. Yes, Dialga. The same being that did this to you is what's keeping them here. I'm sure, totally. And yet this is the case when Dialga is also capable of bringing you back from beyond. Yeah, thanks game. Good job ruining the ending. Now I'm just pissed. And with that, a new future, the end. So how was it? The plot, of course. With the Sky exclusive stuff, half of it wasn't really needed. The Shaman stuff, more Team Charm content, and the some Flora plot line just feel very unnecessary. Well, episodes 5, mainly. 2, and I guess it'd be nice to fit one in as well. They end up fitting nicely. Ultimately, though, they still do end up bringing Need out onto the world to make them feel more complete, and to have characters be characters. Which obviously sets Sky up above the rest, so, uh, yeah, verdict time. PMD2. Yeah, it's a damn fine experience. Splendid even, but a little bit overhyped. However, it does hold true to that title of being a perfect sequel. Truly finding ways to capitalize on everything the original games did, but to also one-up them successfully with little fault is pretty impressive. From the small but noticeable gameplay refinements to a much longer, more involved game experience, to a far more involved story with plenty of high points and character development. They really found ways to fill all the bases and get a third game to snag in for that grand slam. Like, where does the game even fumble. I guess in the team building department, to an extent, filler content and the story carrying a little too much of the game's way makes it pretty hard to actually complain about the game. Outside of what? Constantly hearing people provide suckies to it? Not that enjoying something is inherently bad, but the obscene amount of praise just gives some false impressions of lacking cons that otherwise do exist when looking further beyond. So yeah, enough thinking and more being definitive with a score or whatever. Sadly, Sky goes to four stars while Time and Darkness misses the cutoff with a three. The latter being nice games in themselves and the former obviously bring the power with more definitive content. The status of recommendation though? That's an obvious yes for Sky and a maybe on the other because why are you playing it instead of Sky? Come on now. You know, other than it being cheaper. Regardless, now it's time for my own personalized recommendation. And yeah, I think it's at least worth a shot. Especially if you want to give a single PMD game a try, this is probably the one to go to. The good word of mouth truly does exist for a reason, even if the praise feels blind sometimes. But yeah, that's most games. Also, yeah, I kind of like this one i guess so there's that too i'm willing to bat and say it might be the best pmd experiences yet sky is undoubtedly top three so that's good so yeah fellows and fellettes that's all for today yeah outside of basic like and subscribe plugging nonsense i got nothing on this outro so we're just done so thanks for watching and until next time well i don't even have to yell for this one i just think it's pretty funny that of all the things in this game that could have aged poorly it was the talk of urzarine not being able to evolve that did good stuff <laughs>